Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders is making economic issues central to his campaign. What's at the top of his agenda? Universal health care, free college tuition, and a $15 minimum wage. But while noted liberal economists like Joseph Stiglitz and Robert Reich are applauding Sanders, others like Paul Krugman are taking a different stance. In a recent New York Times column, Krugman calls Sanders proposals unrealistic and outlandish, and he accused the senator of embracing voodoo economics. But what are we to make of this criticism? Are Sanders' economic proposals realistic? Here to take on Krugman's assertions is our guest, Bob Poland. Bob is a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he's also the co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute at the university. And his recent article in The Nation is titled, Bernie Sanders Will Make the Economy Great Again. Thanks so much for joining us, Bob. Thanks very much for having me, Jessica. So, Bob, in your piece, you note that Sanders critics, like Krugman, have supported many of the same economic proposals that he's now running on, like single payer. But we have Krugman now saying that they're unrealistic. What do you make of his arguments? Well, first of all, Paul Krugman and uh, many other liberal Democratic Party associated economists, I think, are making the first big mistake is that they are mixing together what is realistic politically versus realistic economically. And there is important distinctions between the two. So you can say it's unrealistic politically because the Republicans can co control the Congress. Uh, obviously, nothing is going to pass as long as the Republicans control the Congress. So there, if that's our criterion, then why bother to even discuss economic policy at all until the uh, Democrats take over the Congress. So uh, obviously, if Bernie Sanders wins the election and is the next president of the United States, by definition, the political dynamic of the country will have been entirely transformed. And at that point, Bernie Sanders needs to have uh, an agenda, a program that is, yes, inspiring, transformative, and realistic. So on the specific question, the distinct question, are his proposals economically realistic, assuming he has the political power to enact many of them? My answer is yes, they are economically realistic. But folks are going to say that he might have the political power in the executive branch. But of course, the legislature, what we know of and the reality today is that the House and the Senate are com controlled by the Republicans. And, and we know of their history, they're extremely obstructionist. Um, so, so why would Sanders' proposals even see the light of day? And, and, and how could we not take into consideration the very reality that folks like Trump are, are doing so well with, with a lot of folks? Well, you know, bizarrely, uh, you know, I think that the kind of Trump agenda in, in, in some ways is addressing a lot of the same concerns that Bernie Sanders is uh, in, in a completely uh, malign way. And Bernie Sanders is doing it in a benign way. I mean, Trump's, you know, insistence that, you know, the, the trade deals that the, the U.S. has made have been harmful to workers. That's true. Uh, that doesn't mean that we want to kick immigrants out of the country. It means we want to build a more egalitarian economy with full employment and decent wages. And Sanders has much better proposals for getting us there. But, uh, you know, if we take it as a given that the Republicans control the Congress, the Republicans will never uh, vote for anything, anything Hillary proposed, anything Obama proposes, much less anything Sanders. If that's a given, then why are we bothering to do politics at all. Obviously, we need to transform the political environment to make the kinds of proposals that Sanders is advocating realistic. And if he gets elected president, that will be obviously a gigantic first step on behalf of a transformative economic agenda. All right, Bob. At the end of your piece, you point out that the discussion over economic growth should be secondary to the issue of living standards for much of the population. Why is growth sort of always at the forefront of economic discussions in the United States? And, and why do you find it to be so problematic? Well, you know, growth means that the pie is getting bigger. So if the pie is getting bigger, that makes it easier to give out more shares to everybody. So growth 
makes it easy to raise living standards. Now, what we've experienced, though, for over a generation is that, you know, the pie has been getting bigger at a slow rate. So we have not had uh, a very high growth rate. But on top of that, the shares of the pie have been distributed increasingly unequally. So we have inequality. So to just have growth, uh, unless you change our uh, the, the political environment and change economic policies and make economic policies more egalitarian, that means all the growth is going to go into the pockets of the rich, and more or less as has happened, certainly since the end of the recession. So growth is bad uh, if, if it's more unequal. On top of that, if the economy is going to grow and we don't change our energy system, then growth is going to be uh, bad for climate change. It'll be more emissions. So we need a more egalitarian growth, and we need a growth uh, that is consistent with reducing emissions, bringing emissions down to zero. So that's why growth per se is not the answer. Bob, let's turn and talk about uh, some of the fighting going on within uh, the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party. We all know and have heard about what's happening on the Republican side, but you point out in your piece that there is a divide between the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party and the more progressive element within the party. Looking past this election cycle, how do you think this fight is going to continue to play out? And if so, could could it lead to a split even in the party, um, sort of rumblings that we're hearing on the right? But should should that be something that we could potentially see on the left as well? I, it's possible. I mean, you know, I think people need to recognize that since Ronald Reagan, uh, both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party have been framed by the policy agenda set by Reagan, which is government is bad, business is good. And the debate has been over, okay, how much do we all agree government is bad? Uh, so Reagan uh, and George W. Bush and so forth, they all say government is awful, though they're perfectly happy to use government on behalf of business. Um, under uh, Bill Clinton, it was, okay, you know, the Reagan agenda is, you know, pretty much right, but we're going to move it a little bit in the direction of workers, but very, very, uh, you know, minimally, very mild. And uh, as, at the same time that uh, the Clinton administration favored um, deregulation of Wall Street, favored all the free trade agreements, and so forth. Uh, I would say under Obama, it's different circumstances, but Obama did uh, some ma major positive things, getting us out of the recession, uh, reducing unemployment. But at the same time, uh, we still see rising inequality. Uh, we still see massive 33 million people that are uh, without health insurance. Um, uh, emissions, carbon emissions that are causing climate change have not fallen significantly. So that's where we are. So we need a transformative Democratic Party agenda. If we don't get one, if we get a so-called neoliberal agenda, which is essentially a pro-business Democratic agenda, uh, I am very uh, uh, discouraged about the future because we will not reverse inequality. We won't raise living standards for ordinary people. We won't have more access to higher education. Wall Street will still dominate the economy, and we won't control emissions. So that's why we do need a transformative Democratic Party agenda. All right, Bob Polin, always a pleasure having you on the program. Thanks so much for being with us. Okay, thanks for having me, Jessica. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.